All right, in this video, I'm going to go through solutions to the exercise on user defined functions. I do have a new microphone, so if I sound different, uh, hopefully I sound better, but sorry about the older videos not sounding as good, but hopefully this one sounds better. As with all the exercises, I recommend that you attempt them before watching these solution videos. Link to this code and all the other code is in the video description. All the code in this video is going to work perfectly in Octave, just as I'm showing it here in MATLAB. So our first question here comes from MATLAB for Engineers, 5th edition. And some of the questions in that book are just to write simple, small little functions. And that's what we're going to do right here. Now, it doesn't tell us what we should name our function. So I'm just going to name it function one, kind of a bad function name, but that's what I'm going to do here. And we'll call it and let's see, we're going to square something and then take the sign of that value. So let's do some values less than one. Uh, and maybe also pi here. All right. And then let's create this function named function one. I'm going to open up a new tab. I'm going to start all my functions with the name function, with the word function. In the square brackets, some sort of return variable for the results that I'm returning. Sometimes I like to name it results, but other times I'm just going to abbreviate it as y. And then equals, and then the name of the function, and then parentheses, and however many input variables there are. Now there's just one here, so I'm just going to call it x. And then all we really need to do is set y equal to the sine of x squared. We're supposed to square x before taking the sine of it. So there, I'm going to do that. Suppress the output, end the function, save it. Um, MATLAB is going to suggest a good function name. It has The file name has to match the name of the function itself. So the file name is now function1.m, same as the function right here. Uh, and let's run it. Let's resize our screen and then run it. Great, those look like relatively reasonable values for the sine of x squared for these x values. I'm gonna rerun my formatting up here. All right, so we'll move on to the next section. This also comes from the MATLAB for Engineers book. Write a function to convert miles per hour to feet per second. All you gotta do is multiply your miles per hour by this. So let's give this one a better function name. So let's also create some variables. So I'll set miles per hour to 30. Actually, let's set it to 10 right there because that's gonna be a, a feet per second that's gonna be relatively reasonable for somebody to understand. Like, you can run 10 miles per hour. All right, and then I'm gonna name my function miles per hour to feet per second, and I'm gonna pass in the miles per hour variable in the parentheses, and then my result is gonna be a feet per second variable, so uh, I'll give that variable an appropriate name, uh, and then I'm not even gonna worry about displaying it out. We'll just leave it like that. Okay, so now I gotta write this function. So again, I'm going to open up a new tab, start with the word function, square brackets. I'm going to give my results a very good variable name. I don't know why I keep putting T in there, feet per second, and then equals miles per hour to feet per second with an input of miles per hour. The variable names don't actually matter in terms of the variable name that you use outside of the function doesn't actually impact the variable names in here. But a lot of times you want to use the same variable name just so that they're easy to read because they probably contain the same information. All right, what's our multiplier? Okay, here's our multiplier right here. And so feet per second is going to equal miles per hour times this number. Now in the real world, functions are probably a little bit more complicated than this. It's not really that useful to create these really small one-line functions, but we're just practicing getting in the habit of how do you put it together you know, starting with the keyword function and where do the brackets go and things like that. And what does the file name have to be? So that's the purpose of this. All right, so let's go ahead and run this code in this section. Great, those seem very reasonable. 14 and two thirds feet per second. I mean, 10 miles per hour, like running it, it's a significant running pace. Um, so so it is, you know, you're, you're moving pretty well with that pace. So I think that that seems about right to me, about 14 feet per second. All right, moving on down. Write a function named difference that takes two inputs and returns one output. In the function, calculate the absolute value of the difference, the subtraction of the inputs. All right, this time they finally told us what the function name should be, so it should be difference right here. And then let's just see some various differences. So the difference between negative two and zero should be the same as the difference between zero and negative two. Uh, and likewise, zero and positive two. So the order shouldn't matter. And basically, as long as the two numbers are the same distance apart, which negative two and zero, as well as two and zero are, 
we should get the same result every single time. All right, so let's go create our function. Click the plus icon there and then start with the word function. Again, there's only going to be one returned value. You could have more than one, but for these simple examples, it's just going to be one. And I'm going to name my return variable D. I'm not feeling creative on that. And set it equal to the difference of A and B. And then D equals the absolute value of A comma B. Save it. It does need to be saved either in the exact same folder as we're calling the function from, or we need to use add to path to add the folder that the function is in to our path variable. But I'm just saving them all in the same folder, so that will work great. All right, there we go right there. Let's go ahead and run it. And we should get two every time. Uh, apparently I did something wrong. Error using abs, too many input arguments. Huh. Oh, that's not how you do abs. I did that wrong. We're subtracting them. The difference, the absolute value of the difference. Yeah, so I just messed that up. All right, try again. There we go, it's all two. Continuing on down. Create an anonymous function named line EQ or line equation that takes one input and returns the input divided by two plus three. So basically we're plugging in the X value of a Y equals X divided by two plus three line. And we've even got some testing code already set up right here with what the correct answers should be. So I wanna create my anonymous function before uh, I actually use line EQ right here. An anonymous function is just a small little one-line function that you can create in your script that is probably a lot more appropriate for these like small little operations that I was demonstrating with these first few functions. So with our line equation, we want to name it, say it equals, and then the at symbol, as if you're writing an email. So at, and then parentheses, whatever your input variables are. I'm just going to use x because I only need one input variable, and then the calculation. My calculation is x over 2 plus 3. Uh, all right, and then let's run it. Okay, good. And I got the right results for that. So these are just little tiny functions that you can use and declare just inside of your script. You don't need to save it into a whole other file. And it is more appropriate uh, for very short calculations that you want to do repeatedly. Continuing on down. Use function handles to create an extra name for square root. We actually did this, I'm pretty sure, when I was introducing function handles. So basically all I want to do is I want to say that square root equals at sqrt. So this is a way of saying, hey, I'm creating a new name for this function, uh, like a nickname, although it's actually longer than the original, and it will also calculate the square root. It's just another name for the exact same thing. So then when I run this, it's as if I ran this instead. It's just calculating the square root. And there's the results that I get there. Answer the following questions in a comment. Okay, so right here, x equals poly third parentheses a, true or false, based on the given function call. So this is calling a function, which means we're using the function's name followed by parentheses to go and execute the code that's defined in the file poly third.m, the same way we did it with these functions up here. And then the result is returned into a variable and we gotta capture that result and here it's being captured in a variable named x. Now the question is, does polyThird have to use a variable named a and a variable named x inside of the function file, inside of polythird.m? And the answer is no, it does not. The names used on the outside don't have to correspond with the names used on the inside. So the information gets passed between different variables of different names or of the same name, it just does not matter. Next question here. So we've got this function header right here. So we imagine we've got some motion.m file with this function in it and this is just the first line and the question is how this function can return how many values and the answer is three because there's three variables in here in the square brackets which of the following is not an example of calling a function uh, this is not an example of calling a function we are doing some arithmetic and we're putting the results into a variable named y this is a function call right here i mean presumably cos cosine is definitely a function disp is a function these are definitely both function calls Anonymous functions. Use the at symbol, that's true. Are not defined in a separate script, that's true. Are useful for short repetitive calculations, that's what they're for. All of the above is this one. Write a function that takes a vector as input and returns the sum of every other value in the vector, starting with the first value. Name your function whatever you would like, and then here are some correct input and output examples. An answer is given at the bottom of this document, but I'll show you how you would put it together. So we'll name our function sum odd. 
the same as the solution at the bottom. And what I'll set up here is capturing uh, the results of some odd, and then we'll paste in just some of these inputs to test it on. All right, so there's one. And in fact, I'm just gonna copy it a couple more times. So new tab here, function. Again, there's only gonna be one return value. I'll name it result this time. Equals name of the function, parentheses the input. We'll name it v for vector. Don't forget to tab in and indent your code right here. It's really useful for organization. It might not seem that useful right now for these really, really small functions, but when stuff gets more complicated, trust me, you'll want that organization. All right, and we wanna just sum up all the values in the vector, starting at the first one through to the end, every other one. I believe this will do it. Starting at position one, increasing by two, going to the end of the vector. I believe that'll do it. Let's save it. Save it as sumodd.m, save, and then let's run it here. Five, one, and 13, is that what we expect? Five, one, and 13, great. Write a function called triangle area that returns the area of a triangle with base B and height H. B and H are input arguments of the function in that order. Your function must work correctly when B and H are vectors of equal length. In that case, the function must return a vector of areas. An answer to this question is also given at the bottom, but I'll also write it in here. So areas is our result triangle areas right there. We got our bases, uh, we'll create a vector for that. And we've got our heights, we'll create a vector for that. I have no idea, I have not put any thought into this, but there's our vectors. We need to pass those to the function and then new tab, function. I think areas is a really good name for the return values. Equal to the function name. And when it says that you know it has to work if it's a vector, all that means is we need to use the dot operators. So when we multiply the bases times the height, we need to make sure it's dot star the heights. We cannot just use star by itself. We can actually use star by itself over here because this is just a scalar value. It is just a number, a single number, not a vector. Although, if you want to just be safe, just use dot slash and dot star. There's nothing wrong with that. It doesn't break anything. So I'll save it. Okay. And then let's run it right here. And those look like relatively reasonable results, right? This is divided by two is four. Four times one is four. Five times two. Two divided by two is one. That's five. And then this one's three. Yep. Perfect. Great. Write a function called get corners that takes a matrix as an input argument and returns four outputs, the elements of its four corners in this order. Loops and if statements are neither necessary nor allowed. You don't need them. An answer to this question is also given at the bottom, but we're gonna do it right here. Now, I'm just gonna generate a random matrix and we'll look at different dimensions of it, but I'm gonna start mine as a four by three and then we'll display out the result there, and then I'll just get corners on M. All right, so let me close some of these out, and then new tab, functions. I'm gonna call my return variable corners. I typoed that, it's just function. I was wondering why this was pink. It's just function, not functions. So if you ever see any weird color coding, let that be a guide to you that maybe you messed something up. All right, equals get corners, and then we have our matrix right here. I'm gonna name it matrix. All right, now, and all I'm going for with this is corners is going to be a new vector. And at position one of this new vector, we're going to have matrix. Actually, what is the order? Top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right. And I'm going to copy that over so I don't forget it. So the matrix, top left, one comma one. And then the corners vector at position twos, threes, and four. And the next one's gonna to be top right, so row one all the way to the right, end. Next one's gonna be bottom left, so last row, first column. Second one's gonna be bottom row and last column. And I believe that will do it. Save it, okay? And so let's see what we get. Great, here's our matrix. We are expecting eight, nine, 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 and that is exactly what we get. That wasn't as uh, diverse as I would like. Let's try that again. 9629, and there we go. Seems pretty good. All right, and some supplemental material, but I'll cover it on the video here. What is interesting about the number of inputs to plot, and how does Nargin represent this feature of plot? So, what's interesting about plot is that you can pass in a variety of different numbers of inputs. 
So for example, let's just generate some vector here. So rand i, uh, one row, 10 columns. I can just plot that, right? So I can plot that. I can plot uh, two inputs, x and the sine of x. That's not actually gonna be that interesting, but we'll do it anyway. Um, and I can even put in more inputs to the plot function. I can specify that I want a particular line width. And when I run this, I'm gonna get, well, a mess, but I am gonna get a variety of messes, right? So the reason these aren't actually functions is because my x values don't necessarily go in order because I just chose them randomly. And so, yeah, they're gonna be all jumbled, right? You can just connect from this x value to this x value over here because they're gonna be plotted, like whatever points I put in, they're gonna be connected in the order that I gave them to the plot function. So that's why these don't look like, um, they don't pass the vertical line test. They don't look like functions. But the point of the question is, what's the deal with plots inputs? The deal is that there can be more than one input. And then how does Nargin represent this? It gives up and just says, you know what? We're gonna call it negative one. And there's the negative one right there, indicating that plot can take any number of inputs. And then here are some of the answers. You might check them out to see how they compare with the way I wrote them off the top of my head in this video. But uh, that is the end of this video.